Let's start with prayer. Father, um, that you've spoken into our lives is really a miracle. Uh, each of us has our own history with you, and you've spoken into our world. You came and uh, pitched your tent among us, as the Gospel of John says. And Father, I pray tonight that we would have an understanding of all that that means and grasp your, uh, your love and understand more deeply what it is that is really going on as John tells your story. Amen. <clears throat> so, um, yes, recognition to the Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, that's, yeah, kind of uh, amazing. So, uh, so, if you had a chance to listen to the podcast, as I said, I'm sorry, the quality was not meant as broadcast quality. It was just kind of a, trying to get a proof of concept of what we were trying to do. And, um, but it covered basically the rest of chapter one and the first half to, of chapter two uh, of the Gospel of John. And uh, I, I'd like to just kind of summarize what the important issues are that I think uh, we covered in, in those podcasts. Um, as we know, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18, talk about the Word of God, the Logos, coming into our world. And then from verse 19 on to the end of the chapter of chapter uh, 1, it begins to deal more concretely with uh, the figure of John the Baptist. So there's this introduction of Jesus from beyond the beginning. And then there's this story about John the Baptist, about how he was with his disciples and saw Jesus and said, there's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And we talked a little bit in the podcast about what that phrase, the Lamb of God, could mean in the Jewish culture and context. Um, one thing that I really hope uh, you, you asked a very good question, two very good questions last week, or last week before last. Um, one was, what would be my hope uh, for you all from our time together? And I just basically said, I hope that you begin to really love the Gospel of John in a deeper and more intense way, because it's an uh, amazing work of uh, uh, the story about Jesus and also re John's reflection on it in my opinion, as a mature and older person, mature is key, the key word there, uh, I'm getting to the point where I can kind of understand what he was thinking and feeling at about the age when he probably uh, either wrote this gospel or uh, told the stories in this final form to his disciples who began uh, to write them down. But um, at any rate, it's so much thought and so much reflection has gone into the Gospel of John. Uh, I, when I was uh, in junior high, I got kind of interested in rock collecting. Maybe some of you have done that at some point in your life too. Uh, I never pursued it too much, but I did find out how much work it takes to polish a rock. Uh, you can take an agate or uh, quartz or something like that, and it, it takes days and days of tumbling in a water-filled container with carborundum and sand, and then you change to a finer and finer degree of sand until the rock comes out polished. Um, the Gospel of John is like that. It's, if you think, and, and <coughs> we will talk about this during our time together, um, probably not tonight, but in the next weeks. Um, in my opinion, the Gospel of John is the mature fruit of reflection and probably contains the actual sermons and preaching and teaching that, for want of a better name, we'll call him John the Evangelist, uh, preached over a period of maybe 60 plus years 
from the time that he was a teenager and was called by Jesus to be a disciple. And um, there's a very famous sermon in English uh, by, I think it was Russell Conway, uh, called Acres of Diamonds. This, he was a Baptist pastor and he preached this sermon over 10,000 times. And after 10,000 times, the sermon was polished to a point where every word, every gesture, every expression had been so polished that it was uh, just, that was, it, it, and it had a huge impact uh, in the American culture at that time. I don't know if any of you have ever read it, but uh, if, if not, it doesn't, it takes half an hour to read Acres of Diamonds. But um, I sort of visualize the Gospel of John as the written version of that, that John had been ministering and teaching uh, for decades. He was the last of the apostles, probably the only one that did not die a martyr's death. Uh, and he, he, at the very uh, last period of his life in ministry, uh, he had these friends and disciples that were gathered around him. And they, either he wrote down or he dictated or they wrote down as he, as he talked this narrative about Jesus. And so um, we were talking last time about the differences between the first three gospels, the so-called synoptic gospels, uh, that comes from the Greek word for sin is one, not sin, S-I-N, but S-Y-N. Uh, optic means to view it with one view, that Matthew, Mark, and Luke just feel the same. Uh, they often have quotes that are very similar or identical even. Uh, they're the line of story in them is very much the same, but the Gospel of John is much different. And the Gospel of John, I think, is the reflection of these decades of John's preaching and teaching uh, that are sort of distilled down into what we call the Gospel of John. And not surprisingly, uh, in some ways, it's much more polished than the Synoptic Gospels, than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's really hard to find the seams in the Gospel of John, for example, in the teaching of Jesus. Uh, if you look at John chapter three, um, we'll probably be able to look at it a little bit tonight. But if you look at John chapter three, it's really hard to tell exactly where Jesus' speech with Nicodemus leaves off and John's commentary begins. Uh, it, it's just so much John's story of, of Jesus and what he meant that it, it's kind of hard to feel the seam there. And um, I, I think it's exciting because when you understand that, you begin to realize these are... Uh, these are the mature reflections of a follower of Jesus. I believe, we'll kind of talk about this during our time together, but this was someone who was an eyewitness to the life and work of Jesus, probably when he was quite a young man. Um, and this is kind of the mature reflections that he had. Um, in light of that, I'd like to kind of try to recapitulate um, two things. One is we mentioned that at the end of John chapter 1 we have the story of John the Baptist. There's a very interesting literary technique I guess you'd call it or a way of writing with things that happens in the Hebrew Bible quite a bit but John does this too in the first three chapters and it's called bracketing or bookending. Uh, at the end of John chapter 1, you have this section where he talks about John the Baptist and his message to his disciples about Jesus being the Lamb of God. And then we read on, and chapter 2 is there, and we'll talk about why chapter 2 is interesting. And then chapter 3, the conversation with Nicodemus. And then at the end of chapter 3, the other bookend appears, John the Baptist finishes, so to speak. 
And so John is just basically communicating in this framework where John starts with there's the Lamb of God and ends with he must increase, I must decrease, uh, he's the bridegroom, uh, I'm the organizer, so to speak, the friend of the bridegroom that is here to woo Israel to follow the Messiah. So um, that's the first thing that I wanted to note. The second, and um, if you had a chance to listen to the podcast, uh, why chapter two? It, it seems like uh, at first glance, from our point of view, we kind of think, all right, we have this huge story of the word in the beginning and his association with God. And then we have John the Baptist, the Lamb of God and everything. And then suddenly we find ourselves at this wedding in a little Galilean town. And it's kind of like, what happened here? Did, did you feel that at all as you've kind of read uh, the Gospel of John? It's, it's kind of like this dramatic change of scenery. And the question is, why? Well, John uses some really interesting signals. And again, this is typical of the Hebrew Bible, too, that he, he ties these two stories together. And he uses a phrase... Uh, to tie them together, the third day. Um, and what he's doing by doing that, when he talks about the wedding at Cana, uh, he's already described two days in the life of Jesus. And then he says, on the third day, he goes to Cana and is at this wedding. And his mother comes to him. Well, that expression, the third day, pops up again in the second story in John chapter two, which is the story of the cleansing of the temple. And in that particular discussion, Jesus says to the Pharisees and the religious leaders, actually the temple authorities, destroy this temple and I'll raise it again in three days. And this is happening in the temple in Jerusalem. Um, and as a result, they say, you're crazy. <laughs> this place has taken 46 years to build and it's still not finished. And you're going to build it in three days? But it says he wasn't talking about the temple in Jerusalem. Again, this is his replacing the temple. It was the temple of his body. So that little phrase, three days, John is signaling something there that these two stories he's put together for a particular reason. Um, this is one of the things that you, if you're a Bible student, as you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the whole cleansing of the temple narrative is at the end. It's the last week before Jesus is crucified. He cleanses the temple and then events start taking place and he eventually gets crucified. And then of course the resurrection. John though, puts this whole story of the cleansing of the temple way at the front of his narrative. Now, um, some people have trouble with that. <clears throat> Frankly, I don't have any trouble with that anymore. If you look at modern literature, or well, any literature, if you look at movies, many times an author or a writer will pull something from the end of the story up to the front of the film or the front of the narrative because it's important. They want to underline it for some reason. And then the narrative will go on, it'll continue, and then the time when it actually happens, sometimes they'll do a recapitulation of it, or maybe not. So as I've kind of investigated, investigated this and reflected on it, 
I'm convinced that John was doing this for a particular reason, and there's a couple signals about that. First of all, his description of when this took place is very ambiguous. He doesn't say Jesus then went to Jerusalem after the wedding at Cana. Instead, he says the Passover of the Jews was near. Well, okay, what Passover? When? He doesn't say. He just says it was Passover time. And so with that kind of in mind, I began to ask myself, okay, why, why did he put these two things together? Why did he put together the wedding at Cana and the cleansing of the temple? Think of the stories. You're Bible people. Think of the story of the wedding at Cana. Review in your mind what happened. Let's see if we can kind of review it together. Jesus is there. He's with his disciples. That was pretty normal, by the way. A teacher would bring his pupils with him. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen the series The Chosen. It, it's a wonderful series. It's on Prime Video. You can watch the whole first season for free if you're subscribed to Prime Video. Um, but it's a really well done uh, story of the life of Jesus, so to speak. But anyway, so Jesus comes with his disciples. His mother's involved in helping out. Uh, it was probably, the wedding was probably held in the way that uh, sort of ordinary homes were arranged at that time was there would be a, a, a number of houses around a central courtyard. That was often the grandparents, the parents, the children, the aunt, the uncle, and they would have their homes around a central courtyard. That would be sort of the family home. There's an archeological dig taking place in Capernaum, by the way, where uh, they're investigating the traditional site of Simon Peter's home, which uh, is really interesting because it's the same arrangement. And it's probably, uh, it says in the gospels that Capernaum was Jesus' home town, not Nazareth anymore, but he'd relocated to Capernaum and he probably lived in that expanded family unit, so to speak, of Simon Peter's uh, home in Capernaum. So anyway, Cana, they've got this and they're taking care, all the things are taking place in this courtyard. Um, everybody and his neighbor is there and his mother comes to him and says, they've got a problem. Um, they're running out of wine. Well, in our culture, we think, well, go to Trader Joe's for heaven's sake. You know? Well, it wasn't quite that simple. And the potential, and this really touches my heart, the potential damage to the future life of that young couple was enormous. They could have been shamed for their entire life. That's the couple that ran out of wine, you know, and their family embarrassed and everything. So Jesus' mother comes to him and she says, they're running out of wine. And Jesus responds in an interesting way. Um, he doesn't say, oh, yes, ma'am, I'll take care of that. Uh, instead, he distances himself from his mother in a very polite way. But it's very clear, and he says, um, he uses a, in Greek the word gune, which means madam. Uh, what does that have to do with me? And he says, you know my time has not yet come. Well, in the Gospel of John, Jesus' time that he constantly refers to is the time of his crucifixion. So, that's immediately a clue that something's going on here that maybe we don't grasp right away. This was dangerous ground for some reason. He says, basically, if I start down this road, it's gonna end up in my death. We kind of look at it and we think, wow, why? 
Do you remember the rest of the story? What happens next? Yeah, correct. But where was the water supposed to go that he turned into wine? Do you remember? What was it contained in? Yes, really big jars, six of them carrying, yeah, 30 gallons each. That's a lot of wine. And, um, but what were those jars for? The John chapter two, if you have your Bible, look it up. Or if you have your cell phone and want to look it up. Yeah, there were six of them. And they say, Yes. What kind of containers were they, though? Cleansing for the temple? Uh, cleansing for religious rites. These were things that you used to wash your hands before meals. That wasn't like COVID, you know, washing your hands before meals. It was, this was ceremonial. And uh, if you've ever watched uh, a Jewish person wash, a man wash their hands, it's the whole forearm, basically. Uh, it was tremendously healthy for that time. But, somebody have it? Can you read it? Robin? There were six jars there. Or someone else have it? Standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Okay. Six of them made out of what? Stone. Stone. Okay, they weren't clay. These were carved. They were really heavy. Even yeah. So, why stone? Well, the ritual traditions that the Pharisees had developed about cleansing said that water that was to be used for cleansing had to have two requirements. One is, is that it had to be uh, either rainwater or it had to be from a flowing stream. And secondly, it couldn't be put in clay because clay can pick up odors or bacteria or whatever. It had to be done, kept in stone containers. So as a Jewish person was reading this or hearing it, the first thought that would have come to their mind was, oh, Okay, this has something to do with the traditional cleansing rites that take place in the home. Or if you go to Jerusalem sometime on the south side of the temple, the Temple Mount has the Al-Aqsa Mosque and uh, everything up there, but on the south side, there's a, a, a large wall, really tall wall, and at the bottom, at the time of Jesus, at the time of the second temple, there were passageways, stairways, leading up, two or three of them, leading up to the temple mount itself. And at the bottom, there were many, many cleansing pools where if you went up to worship at the temple, you could uh, ceremonially wash yourselves. They were called mikvaot or mikvah, is the singular word for it. Uh, in Orthodox Jewish tradition, even today, uh, before you go to the synagogue service on Friday evenings, you go to the mikvah, uh, particularly women, but also men, to ceremonially cleanse, it, ceremonially cleanse yourself. So this was a big deal. Um, it was very important to one of the key groups of people in Judaism at that time, namely the Pharisees. This was really important to them. They were very committed to keeping Israel pure. That's a whole nother chapter that I hope we'll be able to get to as we go through the Gospel of John. But they were very committed to the purity regulations. Now, we don't feel what a Jewish audience at the time of the Gospel of John would have felt when it said, 
they're out of wine. There were ceremonial stone jars standing there used for purification. Um, if you were a good Pharisee, the hair would begin standing up on the back of your head, the back of your neck. It's hard for us to feel that. Um, this is not a very pleasant example, but imagine the story that you're reading or listening to, and it says, uh, sorry, this is Idaho, so. Um, this guy was in an outhouse, and he discovered there was no toilet paper, but he glanced over and there was a Bible there. What happens to the hair on the back of your neck when you hear that? It's kind of like, seriously? Really? Wherever the story goes, we don't know. We'll leave it right there. It doesn't have to be finished. But um, that's the kind of feeling that a practicing Pharisee would have when they heard this story. It's kind of like, oh, this is not going to end well. And so Jesus pushes aside the ceremonial rules and regulations out of love for this young couple and their situation. And he says, this doesn't matter a bit. Fill it up to the brim. They probably didn't use rainwater either. They probably just went and got water from the nearest well. And they filled it up. And then the miracle happens and Jesus changes the water into wine. Pharisees. They were one of the two power blocks in the Supreme Court and the ruling elite of the nation. The other power block, watch this, were the authorities in the temple. So Jesus, with this story, when he said to his mother, this is gonna get me killed. He was not joking. He knew that if he went down this road, that he would be starting a process that ultimately would end in the Pharisees hating him because he didn't respect their traditions. Don't forget the temple, we come to that in just a moment. But, so he changes the water into wine and the miracle happens. But by doing that, he violated the world view and the traditions of one of the two most important blocks of political leadership and power in the nation of Israel. Of course, everybody was under the Romans, but these were the two important ones. The Pharisees were one of the larger blocks of political power and authority in the Supreme Court of Israel, which was the highest authority under the Romans, the so-called Sanhedrin. First story. Second story, remember who the other folk are that are in charge? The priesthood, those who ran the temple. Do you begin to understand why John pulls this story of the cleansing of the temple forward as if it were a film, you know? This is really important because in the cleansing of the temple, it was the final act in Jesus' conflict with the temple authorities, the priesthood, the Pharisees. His arguments with the Pharisees took place his entire period of ministry. His arguments with the priesthood of Israel, the temple authorities, was more sporadic. It was at different times when he was in Jerusalem. He wasn't always in Jerusalem. He was teaching in Galilee quite a bit of the time. But so these were the two most important power blocks in the nation and religious authorities. The Pharisees were primarily a lay movement. They had their teachers and rabbis. And Jesus said, 
compared to the value of this young couple, I don't really care about your traditions because it's not biblical. It's something that they were adding to try and live more biblically and more holy before God. And then Jesus' cleansing of the temple sealed his fate with the priesthood. So as you look at John chapter 2, for us it's kind of, oh, that's interesting. A wedding. And oh my, that must have been kind of intense, Jesus cleansing the temple. But all the bells that would have gone off for a Jewish person in the first century, we don't hear them. Do you begin to grasp what's going on here? Jesus was basically not kidding when he said to his mother, if I do this, it's going to ultimately end up in my death. And her response was to the servants, she said, do whatever he tells you, it's his decision. And he decides to go ahead and do it. Um, <clears throat> one last point and then we'll uh, take a brief break. But um, I wrote down here uh, for last week, <laughs> um, key proposition, John is a Jewish gospel. Um, all of the gospels are in some sense Jewish stories. Um, Matthew obviously is written for a particular flavor of Judaism. It's much closer to the rabbis. But John is also an incredibly Jewish gospel. And as we are together, uh, hopefully over the next uh, period of time together, uh, we'll understand a little bit more, I think, exactly what John was doing uh, and why this was such a Jewish story and such an intense, uh, an intense struggle for the heart of Judaism. So that's kind of summarizing where we are tonight uh, with the bookend of John the Baptist at the end of John chapter two, uh, sorry, at, at the end of John chapter three. But before we get to the end, uh, the other bookend of John, we're going to come up with a story that also relates to the Pharisees, one of the teachers of the Pharisees, uh, Nicodemus. Um, there is actually a figure in the rabbinic teachings, uh, the later rabbinic documents, that may actually be uh, Nicodemus. Uh, it's all kind of speculative, but um, if it is the teacher that is identified in the so-called Talmud, the, the later Jewish writings, re records of the rabbis, uh, he was probably quite a young man at the time, uh, just beginning his teaching. But I think this is a good place to stop for a few minutes uh, until we uh, can then start John chapter three. Before we do though, any questions or comments? I mean, this is another example, of that, uh -huh. right? So it's like in the beginning how Adam and Eve did what they did, but then it's all been worked ever since that. Uh -huh. It was grace to begin with. Yes. And it's like with these temple things, it's like, why couldn't they have just accepted Christ? Uh -huh. And you know, I look at it like, I want power. Uh -huh. I want to work, I want to be God myself. Yeah. You know, I mean, in my human form, right? Yeah. Without being saved. Yeah. I think no, I th I'm that, saved. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think you you're absolutely right. Um, maybe it comes with getting older, <laughs> but I I somehow have a little sympathy for them too though. I kind of think you've spent your whole life constructing this life and way of living that you think is the way to honor God. And everything's, the boxes are all there and everything's sorted out. The Pharisees weren't, um, weren't evil pagan people. All, I mean, there were obviously evil people involved, but many of the early followers of Jesus came out of that movement. 
And so you kind of ask yourself, is there anything in my life that is so important to me that I would not let God change it? <laughs> and I, I completely agree with what you're saying. But I also have this kind of thing in the back of my mind of, it really is important to be careful to be open to God's voice in new directions. You know? um, when he challenges us to go new ways and new paths. And I, I have a, a certain, certain sympathy. Uh, you, you look at Nicodemus, he was a Pharisee, and he's struggling with this. He's kind of, what are you talking about? You know, we'll get that, though, in just a few minutes. So, good. Thanks. <laughs> okay, let's take a break, maybe for five minutes or so, and then we'll come back. Yes, question. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's the only way I can imagine they did that. So. <laughs> it would yeah. take a long time. Yeah, yeah, I mean, heavy, it was serious, and uh, yeah, they were heavy, so. Okay. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll be talking uh, over the course of the, the, our time together a bit about the temple in Jerusalem, and uh, it was, it's been said, there are cities that have a temple, but Jerusalem was a temple that had a city. And uh, it, it encompassed a quarter to a third of the entire territory of Jerusalem. It was huge, is huge still in the old city. Um, but um, there was a lot of stonemasonry done and a lot of artisan work of everything from bronze to gold to whatever. You know. um, so there. Uh, by the way, it, it's highly likely that um, Jesus' father and Jesus himself were, uh, were stonemasons. Uh, we think carpenter and we think like somebody putting up a frame for a house. Uh, they probably worked in wood when necessary, but probably what they really were doing most of the time was stonework. So interesting, it's kind of a different world than the way we usually sort of picture Jesus. So there's a great scene in, uh, let's see, The Passion of the Christ, where the carpenter shops there and Jesus' mother Mary's there. And he says, I'm, you know, when they ate, they would eat at these low tables with, and, and recline at table. And he says, I'm making a table that you can actually sit at. And she says, it'll never sell. <laughs> so anyway, that's kind of a cute idea. So, okay. John chapter 3, um, water and the spirit. Um, let me just find my place here. So... Yes, starting with John chapter 3, verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. That probably means he was a member of the Sanhedrin, the highest Jewish political structure. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Um, yeah, as I said, the, the reference that Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews probably doesn't mean necessarily that he was upper class, but that he was an official member of the high council uh, in Jerusalem. And the fact that he was a man of the Pharisees probably is also an indication that he was, uh, he was asking questions that others were asking as well. But he's talking about a specific individual and Nicodemus would have observed the purity laws. 
that Jesus sort of hung on a hook <laughs> in Cana at the wedding. So uh, Nicodemus comes to him with respect and uh, Nicodemus ends up at the end uh, taking with Joseph of Arimathea the body of Jesus down from the cross. So this story is not over yet, but Nicodemus would obviously have had a lot of questions for Jesus. And uh, the Pharisees didn't have any vested interest in the temple. Uh, that was the province, as we said earlier, of the priesthood and the ruling class of the temple hierarchy. Those were the upper class people. They, they had most, the ones that ruled the temple uh, had the power under the Romans, of course. And as a result, the Pharisees had no great problem with calling the temple into question but calling their religious purity traditions into question was a completely different story. Um, so he comes to Jesus at night and he says, we know. That's an interesting little word. He continues, no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Um, <clears throat> Matthew, Mark, and Luke also report what we call miracles that Jesus did. That's the word we use for it in English. But John avoids that word for some reason. He doesn't use the same word that Matthew, Mark, and Luke use, and the fact that the entire New Testament uses for miracles. Uh, he uses this word signs. And that's an interesting question that we can kind of keep in the back of our mind is why he doesn't use the word miracles. But there's been a lot of speculation about why Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. Uh, some thought that he came out of fear of the other Jewish leaders. He might lose his reputation. Maybe he was a timid person. But um, the movement of the Pharisees was a lay movement. And so, except for the very highest rabbis who could basically afford because of their huge following, not to work. Most of the rabbis and most of the Pharisees had day jobs. Uh, they worked doing whatever. You know, they were stone workers or they had a shop or they were a lay movement. And so it, it wasn't unusual for the theological discussions that the Pharisees had to take place in the evening after uh, sunset, after dinner. Uh, that would be the time they got together and uh, would ask questions. So it's, we can speculate about it, but it was after the work day. And Nicodemus may have just come at that time out of convenience. Jesus was obviously surrounded most of the day by large crowds, and he came. But in the Gospel of John, the word night is an ambiguous word, darkness. It can also mean moral darkness and spiritual darkness. And so Nicodemus coming at night has maybe got that kind of flavor to it also. So he comes to Jesus and he politely calls him rabbi or teacher. It, and he says it wouldn't have been possible for Jesus to perform these signs that he's done uh, unless God were with him. And Jesus kind of cuts to the chase and says, Unless one is born again or born from above, is another way to translate that, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus begins to make clear that the core issue is not a question of outward observances or a question of inheritance, Jewish, non-Jewish, what's my genealogy. It's not a question of belonging to the Jewish race or keeping the religious practices of the Jewish people but it's a question of whether one has the spirit of God or not. Now, Nicodemus obviously knew the Hebrew Bible and he de Jesus declares to him, uh, I'm going to say something here that is really important to you. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. This is the first time in the Gospel of John, but it's not the last one that Jesus challenges people to a new way of seeing. Look, pay attention, open your eyes, 
So he says, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. Um, Jesus says literally here that one needs to be born from above or born from anew. And Nicodemus goes literal on him. <laughs> and it's probably meant as a serious question, but it's kind of like, what are you talking about? Can we go back into our mother's womb and be born? And this representative of the Pharisees' religious elite, basically, is clueless about what Jesus is talking about. He stands in probably for the whole class of people who just didn't get it. How can a man be born when he is old? And Jesus says then, truly, truly, those are two Hebrew words, by the way, amen, amen. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been at a synagogue service. It's still present in the synagogue service today. Um, the, uh, at certain places in the synagogue literature, it says, and all said, and then the congregation says, amen. And then the leader of the liturgy says, amen, amen, truly, truly. So it's, uh, it's a very old expression. But the interesting thing is uh, that Jesus says, I, this is important. It's so important that I really want you to listen to it. And then he says, unless one is born of water and the spirit, they cannot enter the kingdom of God. There's been a discussion that's gone on for centuries in Christian teaching about what it means to be born of water and the spirit. Um, I've kind of wrestled around with this and a lot of other people smarter than I have also. Um, and I think the best answer to what Jesus is saying here is that this is kind of an interpretive riff on a section of the prophet Ezekiel. You remember the uh, God pouring out his spirit on the people in a new way on the nation of Israel? Do you remember the old uh, African-American spiritual dem bones? Uh, about the bones that were in this vision that the prophet Ezekiel had. They were just dead bones in this valley of judgment. And the wind comes and these bones begin to go together again and flesh comes on them and they come to life. And that wind in Hebrew is the very same word for spirit. And so Ezekiel was playing with this concept of wind and spirit in that vision that God gave him. And Jesus, I think, is picking up on that. And he said, if you really want to understand what's necessary to see the kingdom of God, to recognize what's going on, and to be part of God's new world, which was the key Jewish question was, how can I be part of God's new world? It wasn't, how do I get to heaven? It was, how can be, I be part of what God's going to be doing in his new world uh, when he remakes everything? Um, and so he says, uh, you need to be born of water and of the spirit. And um, Ezekiel talked about this giving God giving people a new heart. And I, I think that water needs to be understood here in con the context of the whole Gospel of John. And Jesus was probably referring to the baptism of, of proselytes, of people that wanted to become Jews. But remember, John the Baptist. He was calling the nation to repentance. He was basically using water rituals for Jews that were actually intended for Gentiles that wanted to become Jews. And he was saying, you need to repent. You need to be part of God's new program. And so it was a radical thing, and it was a baptism of repentance. And Jesus, I think, is saying here, it's an interesting phrase, and it probably means you need to go through the repentance that John is talking about. That's what it means to be born of water and of the Spirit, is just that you need to understand that you need the Spirit of God to come upon you in a new way to remake the nation of Israel. Um, 
So Nicodemus, though, still doesn't really get it. And he's still a distance from where he's ultimately going to end up. But Jesus says to him, I say to you, unless this one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And in other words, unless one's willing to go through the type of repentance that John the Baptist was talking about, also for Jewish people, and receive the Spirit of God through Jesus, one cannot be part of God's new world. So I think what Jesus was saying, repentance and the gift of the Spirit. And we're going to be coming across that again and again in the Gospel of John. And Jesus says in verse 6, that which is born of flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. In other words, he's making clear this isn't some evolutionary development from flesh to spirit. This is a radical quantum leap, a, a, a radically new thing of God's spirit birthing people to new birth, new, new life in Christ. And Jesus says in verse 7 to Nicodemus, you shouldn't be surprised at my saying you should be born again. I could imagine Nicodemus saying, right. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to be surprised by this. Well, Nicodemus is supposed to be a teacher of Israel. And Jesus is probably saying, didn't you read Ezekiel? Don't you get it? You're the teacher of Israel. Think of your own Hebrew Bible what, what, what's so difficult about understanding this? Because in Ezekiel 36, God says, I will cleanse you, I will cleanse you, note. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I'll put within you. I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh, he's speaking to the Jewish people, and give you a new heart of flesh and I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my laws. So Jesus is saying basically, Nicodemus, don't you understand what happens in God's new world? You really need to know this. You're a teacher. You know, make some connections here. He's not impolite, but he's saying, come on, Nicodemus, let's get these wires put together. Uh, you're the teacher of Israel. And um, I mentioned that wind and spirit are the same in Hebrew. That's also true, by the way, in Greek uh, and also in Aramaic, which was probably the common language that was spoken in uh, Galilee and Judea by the Jewish people at the time of Jesus. It's kind of a, uh, kind of a descendant, I guess you would say, of Hebrew. Uh, it, it's very similar to Hebrew, but it was probably the common language that was used. But, it's always the same, wind and spirit are the same word. So everyone born of the spirit, just like the dry bones in Ezekiel's vision. And Jesus uh, shares this in verse nine, Nicodemus again responds, totally clueless, how can these things be? And Jesus says, are you the teacher of Israel? Yeah, you don't understand this. And Jesus is saying to him, how do you not understand this? Have you not studied the teaching of the prophets? Don't you know about Ezekiel? Haven't you heard of the voice of the Spirit, how it blows through the bones, gathering a new people of God, being born into a new community? How are you going to get this, Nicodemus, if you don't even un investigate and really think through the Hebrew scriptures? Um, we'll see later in the Gospel of John, but um, I don't know if you've ever been at a really formal dinner where they have uh, sterling silver uh, plates and things like that, uh, serving things. Sterling silver, um, the old sort of really classy kind, has on it a mark called a hallmark. And it's the stamp that the uh, person who made it puts on it. Um, Paul Revere, <laughs> some of the most valuable silver things that are in the United States today are, have the mark of Paul Revere, the silversmith from Boston, you know. 
So, and, and there's others that are much older, but the hallmark, that sort of stamp on God's new people is the presence of his spirit. The Holy Spirit, according to the New Testament, and particularly John, the hallmark of true Christian faith is the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's the presence of the Holy Spirit in our individual lives and in our life as a community. It doesn't depend on the words we use. It doesn't even relate to our social position. It has to do with having the Spirit of God of being born from above. And this ultimately, according to the Gospel of John, is the, question, the answer to the question of who we are. The real answer whether we come from the upper class or lower class or middle class, the answer is we are the people of the Spirit. And that is a dramatic thing at the time of the New Testament. The Apostle Paul can write, he can say, in Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek, Jew or Gentile, that's huge, uh, male or female, doesn't mean there aren't a difference between male and female or that there's a difference between Jew and Greek. Yes, there is. Slave and, and, and free, the slave and the master, but we are one in Christ because we have the Spirit. That's who we're meant to be. We're the people of the Spirit, the New Testament says. And Paul's thinking in 1 Corinthians, for example, says that a person without the Spirit of God uh, doesn't belong to God's new world, isn't part of God's people. And Jesus says, you need to understand this. Because it says, you all, you Pharisees, in verse 12, um, you have, or 11 and 12, you haven't accepted and you're continuing to not accept our witness. If I've told you earthly things and you don't believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Well, what kind of heavenly things? Well, remember the end of chapter one, it says Jesus is the place like the ladder of God that Jacob had in his vision when he was on his way to his uncle's and he lays down and he says, this is the house of God because he saw the angels of God ascending and descending. Jesus basically at the end of John chapter one said, I'm the replacement for that. I'm where you can find God. That's a huge claim. It's almost unimaginable what that must have, the effect that must have had. And this vision of heaven is tied in with the prophet Ezekiel, again. And so Jesus says in verse 13, no one has ascended into heaven except he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Um, that term, the Son of Man, is important and we're gonna come back to that. But um, Jesus claimed that he ascended and descended from heaven. He came from heaven and he will ascend again into heaven. And he's saying to, Jesus, to Nicodemus, you need to understand this. And then he goes into this metaphor about Moses and the serpent. And this gets close to this very famous verse that we all know, John 3, 16. But in verse 14 and 15, just before that, Jesus says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So what is he talking about? Nicodemus obviously knew the Jewish Bible and the story is there in the book of Exodus and Numbers, the, in the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, the Torah, the five books of Moses. Uh, in the wilderness, when the people of Israel had been led out of Egypt, they complained and sinned against God. And God sent a plague of serpents. Uh, it's 
kind of normal in the desert, isn't it? <laughs> we know what that means here uh, in Idaho. Um, I won't get into my teenage years, but uh, at any rate, this plague of serpents was, there were deadly serpents, and God said to Moses, he said, I want you to do something. I want you to make a snake out of bronze and to put it up on a pole and set it up in the camp. And everyone who is willing, that has the faith to come and look at that serpent, will be healed and will live. Jesus says to Nicodemus, just like Moses put the serpent on the pole, that's the key to understanding what I'm going to be doing to heal the curse of sin for God's people. And then comes verse 16, which if you had any experience in Sunday school, you obviously memorized it. Uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That's probably not the best translation, sorry. <laughs> Don't mean to interfere with your childhood memories. It probably is better translated, God loves the world like this. God loves the world this way, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. So God's love, we usually understand it as meaning God loved the world so much, don't we? That's the way we usually read that. God so loved the world. But it actually probably means better translated, God loved the world this way. This is the way God's love is manifested. This is the way God's love is shown, is that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. So it goes on and uh, Jesus talks about darkness and light. That's a whole new topic that comes up again and again in the Gospel of John. Uh, about light and darkness. It says he's obviously using light in a, in a metaphor. He's saying people choose moral and spiritual darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And he goes on then and he says at the end, um, there's a review, so to speak, at the end of chapter 3 about... Um, where John the Baptist sort of closes out his message to his disciples and to the world. And he says, follow him. He must increase, but I must decrease. And that picture there is probably like the picture of the moon fading in light as the sun comes up. So as the sun increases, the light of the moon uh, becomes less and decreases. It's the light of day. And so the important picture here of God giving his son as a sacrifice for sin as the Lamb of God is um, something that I think we're going to have to talk about a little bit because it's, it's difficult for some people. And again, um, where Anne and I work and live most of the time in Berlin, uh, this is a hard concept for people to understand about God giving his son. Um, I'd like you to just suspend judgment for just a minute and try to put yourself in the place of someone who has never believed in God and who hears that God gave his son for sin. It sounds to a person that grew up far from the door of the church like abuse. That's really difficult for people. And that's why the message is, the, the totality of the message of the gospel is so important. Like the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. That's the reason, ultimately, we don't have to call it that, but that's the reason why it's so important 
to understand that God was in Jesus. It isn't the Father saying, yeah, he can suffer. But it was God himself in all of his three personhood choosing to save his lost creation. I found when I'm explaining the gospel to non-believers who don't have a religious background, that's really important. Because obviously there's so much trash in the world about relationships and abuse in families and things like this. To explain it wasn't God sort of making his son suffer, but it was God in Christ that he was choosing to come into his lost world and creation and save them. Does that make sense? Do you, do you I don't know if you've ever had conversations like that, but I have more than once. And I think just that simple explanation of how we say things uh, is helpful to just say, you know, God came and sought his lost world, his creation in Christ. And later we can talk about what Father, Son, and Spirit mean and the whole issue of the theological meaning of all this. But it's very clear from the New Testament that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was curious if Hebrew had different words for world. Yes. Uh, and I guess the reason behind mm -hmm. this question is it says God so loved the world in 316. Right. But in John 15, uh, John, Are you looking for the verse that says well, the, the world will hate you? First John 2.15 says, do not love the world with anything in the world. Right. Anybody love the world, love the world. Yes. And yeah. So I guess I was... That's an excellent that question. Might have two yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, in the background, of course, is Hebrew and Aramaic, but the New Testament was written in Greek. And <clears throat> the... The actual word is, the, the sort of standard word for world uh, is cosmos. And that word has a breadth of meaning though. Um, it can mean, we get our word cosmetics from it. Uh, it can mean appearance or beauty. It can mean um, organization and structure like we use the word cosmos, you know, the cosmos. Um, but it also can be translated world. And you have to decide from the context what that means. And the interesting thing is, I, I think you've put your finger on something very important, is, is that the world rejected Christ. In John chapter one, it says he came to his own and he didn't receive him. He came into the world that he'd made and they didn't uh, accept him. And in some degree, God's love wrapped his arms, so to speak, around that that rejected him. But a part of that world doesn't change. And in John chapter three, it says, people can choose darkness or light. And you've, you've picked out a very important theme for the entire gospel of John which is light and darkness and related to the world. And uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's, but it's not a question of different words, it's a question of different contexts and meaning uh, for the word world. Um, we can use that in our modern thing like uh, the world of my grandson or uh, the world court. Uh, we just, you have to really pay attention to the context of, of the word. But that's an excellent question. 
Any other questions about John chapter 3? I actually have a note here. Who then is the world for the author of John? In John 15 and the first part of 16, uh, the Judean religious authorities are labeled as the world, the opponents of Jesus that wanted to kill him. But it goes on in, like you quoted from 1 John also. So, um, we're basically at the end of John chapter 3. And the scene is going to change uh, this next week to John chapter 4. Remember I said we, would, we don't understand why the hair stood up on the back of the Pharisee's neck when they heard about these ceremonial pots? It gets even worse <laughs> in John chapter 4. It, it just is kind of like, whoa. Um, there's a great scene in this series, The Chosen, um, where Jesus tells his disciples they're going to go through Samaria. And the disciples say, what? <laughs> the Samaritans, they just, they're evil. They destroyed our temple. They, they polluted the land. They're, they're, they're heretics. They, they're, they're not Jews, but they believe some things. And Jesus says, get used to this. <laughs> uh, this is going to happen more than you imagine. So uh, that's what comes next. Any thoughts or questions? about John 3. Good thoughts and ideas that you've had too. Um, there's a lot, a lot there, a lot more. <laughs>